Let me say good evening to those of you who make up our Facebook family as well as our YouTube family as we prepare for our Bible study on this evening. I trust that you are prepared. If you don't have, please get your Bible ready as we will go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 29. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 29. Here's what the Bible says. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Let me read it one more time. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Listen, I want to talk about this evening uh, a subject matter that I'm sure for some will be a little bit uncomfortable. As a matter of fact, I won't be surprised if you change the channel on me real quick uh, because of what I'm going to talk about from the very word of God as I try to dig into this particular verse and into this uh, particular text, uh, I'm going to be dealing with the subject of cursing and profanity. And here is the question tonight. Should Christians use profanity? Should Christians be cursing people or people who use curse words? I see some of y'all are flinching already, but it's okay. Just fasten your seatbelt and let's just walk through the word of God. Listen, public and private use of profanity and vulgarity has lowered the standard of morality and decency in our society. Words that were once used very sparingly, even by sailor, sailors who were at sea, have now become commonplace in our conversation, commonplace in terms of our communication one to another or about another, or even just about things in general. There was a time, and maybe some of you are old enough to remember this time, there was a time when radio stations would not allow the kind of language that we hear in today's world. Television stations would not allow or permit persons to use all kind of vulgarity and uh -huh, curse words and foul language. And if somebody did say it, they would bleep it out where you couldn't hear it. The general public didn't have that exposure like we do now. Now anybody can just say what they want to say, when they want to say it, how they want to say it, and it don't make no difference. But there was a time when even the print media didn't allow the use of certain terms and words and phrases uh, and, and that type of exposure to the general public. But time has brought about a change. And not only has time brought about a change, but um, sin has brought about a change. What was once taboo has now become the trend in our day and time. Used to be a time when you just wouldn't hear people say certain things in certain places or even to certain people, but now it don't make no difference one way or another. People say what they want to say, when they want to say it, to who they want to say it to, wherever they are, it don't make any never mind. What was once taboo in our talking to one another or talking about one another has become today the trend and common place. I don't know why, but some people have begun to believe that the frequent use of foul language, or as Paul calls it, corrupt communication, makes them more socially acceptable in their circles. What you're trying to say, Reverend, I'm trying to say 
that there are some people who don't cuss as much until they get into a certain circle of people or friends. For some reason or another, it makes them more socially acceptable to that group, to that crowd, to that, to that circle of acquaintances. And so they are freer to use words and terms and phrases that uh, are, are, are unacceptable and clearly unapproved by God. But they, they can talk more freely when they get within the framework of that circle of friends because that's the kind of language that those people use. And to fit in with those people, they find themselves using the same type of words and same type of language. But may I stick a pen right here and tell you that even though there is some language that has become socially acceptable in the eyes of men, some language that has become socially acceptable in the ears of men, please do not think that it is acceptable in the eyes and the ears of God. And so this is uh, probably on this evening what we could call a MC Hammer moment. What do you mean by that? This is a moment of a can't touch this type subject. Many of you probably would prefer that I wouldn't even talking about this, addressing this, dealing with this, because you would rather for me not to be touching it, none whatsoever. But even though MC Hammer said can't touch this, I'm gonna touch it tonight, because the real truth is, uh, We've got to look at what the Bible says that is all right with God and it may not necessarily be all right with men. Men want to be able to do what they want to do, how they want to do it as it relates to that, but God has an order for his people. God has a way for his people. God has the will for his people and God has the word for his people. And that word comes to us even right now in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed or come out of your mouth. But the only kind of communication that should come out of your mouth is that which is good to the use of building something up or building others up in a good way that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Some people deal with profanity, we deal with bad language or foul language or vulgarity. We, we treat it as if though it's a small sin, a little sin that, you understand, know is no big deal. We have, we have the tendency to, to put sin in certain categories. And some sins we say, oh my God. And then other sins we act like, oh, that ain't nothing. You understand? We can live with that. We can accept that. That's all right. That ain't enough to send you to hell. Well, let me tell you something. We may have the, the propensity or we may take the position of putting sins in different categories and saying this one is a big one and that one is not a big one. It's just like you used to saying a lie was a little white lie. Well, a lie is just a lie. There's no such thing as a little lie and a big lie is just a lie. And you can't put a color on a lie by calling it a white lie or a black lie or a brown lie, a lie is just a lie. And the Bible says you are not supposed to be lying in the first place. And so it is, God does not put sin in categories of small and big. God puts all sin in the same category. And that is the category of disobedience. That's the category of rebellion. And whenever we choose to use words and language that we know that's inappropriate in God's ears and in God's eyes, every time we do it, we are being disobedient and we are being rebellious towards God. Can I ask you a question this evening? Since I'm already deep in the heart of Texas, can I ask you a question? Why do people use C words? 
Why do people use curse words? Why do we even use vulgarity? Why do we even use profanity? Uh, why do we allow ourselves uh, to voice and vent expletives and compounded words and phrases that are indecent and profane language? Listen, I don't have to start making no list for you because the truth of the matter is that you already know the kind of words I'm talking about. No sense to me, you understand, keeping it real and just spelling it out because I can't do that and you know I can't do it. But listen, you know like I know that all of us have got a catalog or a library of words that are still in our minds even though they may not come out of our mouth as much or as frequently as they once did. In other words, it doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, you still know how to cuss. You just may not cuss as much. Or maybe you don't cuss as much as some other people. Because people do curse. People do use profanity. But here is what the Bible says, that the Christian has to learn how to put his old life on the shelf because now he is a new creature. She is a new creation in Christ Jesus. And there are some things about our old self that must dissipate, must disappear, must be removed even from our daily dialogue. And Paul, if you will, helps us to understand that when he says, let no corrupt communication even proceed out of your mouth as a believer. Listen, let me just go and do this real quick because I'm trying to stir in this pot just for a moment. What do, what, what do people mean when they call you a name that your mama didn't give you when you were born? Why do people call us names or call us out of our name and to use words and expletives that, you understand, do not represent our government name or the name that our parents gave us when we were born. Why do people do that? Why do people do that? And I'm not going to answer it for you. You think about it for a minute. Listen, how does it make you feel when you are labeled or described as something you are not? And that's generally what happens when people use curse words and profanity. They label us. They label you or you label somebody as being something that they are not. And, and it don't always have to be somebody. Sometimes when people curse, they use curse words not toward a person, but they use curse words even toward a thing. The thing has a a a legitimate name, a real name, and not a name that is built upon adjectives <laughs> and, and descriptive words and compounded phrases that we may come up with in our talk and in our conversation. But why uh, uh, do people do that? And uh, how does it make you feel when somebody uses that kind of language on you or against you. Paul said, believers ought to use the kind of language and words that build one another up. Not words that tear people down, but words that build somebody up. Not words that make people feel as if though I'm less than a Christian, but words that help to convince them that maybe I am a Christian. And so it is, uh, Paul says that all of the words that we use, their aim and objective ought to be to uh, benefit the hearer. And so it is, how does expletives, how does compounded words and phrases that we call curse words or cursing somebody out, how does that benefit the hearer and how does it benefit the relationship between you and the person who hears it? 
How does that benefit the relationship when you use curse words toward somebody or on somebody or even with somebody? How does that benefit the relationship with the person who is hearing what you are saying? Hold on. I'm getting ready to dig a little bit deep. I hope you're ready for this. If cursing is wrong for a child, why is it all right for an adult? If as a parent, you do not allow your children to use curse words, then why do you use the words you won't allow them to use? If it's wrong for them to use them, then would it be wrong for us to use them? Listen, at what age does it become all right to do what's wrong? I know somebody said, well, they're a child and I'm a grown up. They're a child and I'm an adult. And when you get to be an adult, you understand it's like you got some liberties available to you by God that are not available to you when you are a child. Can I suggest to you that nowhere in the Bible have I read or discovered where cursing is wrong for children, but okay for grown-ups. And nowhere in the Bible have I read where God gives grown-ups the permission to do what's wrong and then to train and teach their children to do what's right. Listen, I just wonder today, when we think about that text that we call the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others to do unto you, here's a question I would pose, and I told you this is going to be rough today, but I hope you'll stay with me. Here's a question I want to pose. If cursing is permissible, if cursing is cool, if cursing is all right, if cursing is something that should be an accepted form of talking and communicating, I just want to know then who do you give permission to curse you out no matter what their age is? Who do you give permission to curse you out or to curse in your presence regardless of their race, regardless of their gender, regardless of the reason they are using this kind of language. You see, sometimes we think it's all right to curse because we feel like we got a good reason for cussing. But let me tell you something. I done met a whole lot of folk who don't need no reason to cuss. They just cuss because they seemingly like cussing or the vocabulary is rather limited and so they don't know how to say what they want to say without cursing. And so it is, who do you give permission to be in your presence and to just use all kind of vulgarity, all type of language that is inappropriate and, and, and you know God don't like it? Who do you give permission even though the relationship between the two of you may be real close, do you give your husband, do you give your wife permission to use bad language, corrupt language, foul language, indecent language in your presence whenever they want to or whenever they want to point it in your direction? Do you give them permission to talk to you any kind of way they want to talk? If cursing is all right, who are the people you gonna give permission to use it without any limitation? Listen, my brothers and sisters, here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter two, verse number 21. I don't know if you've ever read it, but here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter two, verse 21. It says, thou that teachest another, do you teach your own self the same thing? Hold on. He said, here's what the Bible says, thou that preaches, thou shalt not steal, or you a person who turns around and steal. In other words, I want to say to every, every, every preacher, every teacher, every parent, and every guardian, the Bible raises this question. It's a plain and simple question. Why do you teach other people not to do something 
and then you do the very same thing your own self. Why do you instruct people, train people, preach to people, teach people what is not a good thing to do, and then you do it your own self? Plain and simple. The Bible is saying that we should not be the kind of people who tell our children, don't do what you see me do, just do what I say. Or don't say what you hear me saying, just do what I tell you in relationship to not using a certain kind of language. And so it is. There's another old saying, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. In other words, if it's all right for one person to do it, it should be all right for somebody else to do it. And if it's all right for you to talk to somebody that way, it ought to be okay for them to talk to you in the same way. But you know, we become highly upset. We become highly perturbed. Oh yes, we will get loose in a Minnesota minute and jack somebody up when they start using the wrong kind of language toward us, to us, against us, about us. And yet at the same time, we will flip the script in our own anger and do the very same thing. When the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, he asserted that their new life in Jesus Christ as born-again believers warranted a new lifestyle. They were to avoid any acts. They were to avoid any actions. They were to avoid any kind of activities and even the articulation of words that reflect a immoral behavior. Paul says you are the children of God. You are a child of God. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you've got to, if you will, check yourself and check your use of words and things that you would say that surely do not represent the person of Jesus Christ and the person of the Holy Spirit that lives and abides within you. Matter of fact, if you read verse number 30, I know I just said Ephesians 4.29, but if you read verse number 30, here's what the Bible says in verse number 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Listen, my brothers and sisters, Paul warns us against bringing sorrow to the heart of the third person of the Trinity. He warns us again, uh, again about bringing sorrow to the heart of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. And as a person, the Holy Spirit can be touched and moved by things like you and I. So in other words, here's what Paul says, that when you understand that the Holy Spirit is a person, that the person of the Holy Spirit can be made to feel sad and sorrowful because we are speaking the kind of words and language that's unbecoming of a child of God, especially when we got the Spirit of God living within us. Oh my goodness, listen. Here's what Paul wants us to know, that the Holy Spirit is in us to help us. The Holy Spirit is in us to support us and to sustain us. The Holy Spirit is in us to guide us. And, and all I'm trying to tell you is that, that the Holy Spirit is really in us to help control some attitudes and actions and the articulation of words. And whenever we let another spirit other than his spirit move into our heart, it means that, that we sadden him who is there to rescue us from the one, good God Almighty, who is there to ruin us. Satan wants to ruin us. Satan wants to ruin us. He wants to ruin our life. 
He wants to ruin our families. He wants to ruin our dreams. He wants to ruin our hopes. He wants to ruin our futures. He wants to ruin our relationship with God. He wants to ruin our reputation. And how can he do that? He can do it simply by what comes out of our mouths. Mess up with our children. Mess up with our spouses. Mess up with our friends. Mess up with opportunities to advance because we freely use words and we think that they are socially acceptable, but the person who hears your words may not like the words that you are using. Listen, they may let you talk all day, but it doesn't mean that they appreciate the way that you are talking and the language that you are using. Not only does all sin in our life grieve the Holy Spirit, but surely, when I say all sins, I'm talking about all of them other sins that you could come up with other than the one I'm talking about right now. Truly, all of those other sins grieve the Holy Spirit, but Paul says something that you think that don't mean that much at all, like the way we talk and the words we use. And especially if we get angry, you understand, if we get ticked off, if somebody get on our last nerve, Paul says we've got to monitor even so the message that comes out of our mouth. And so it is, the Holy Spirit has feelings and the Holy Spirit is grieved when we find ourselves talking and using the kind of language that is unbecoming of a child of God. Listen, my brothers and sisters, no wonder David said in Psalms number 141 and verse number three, when you get a chance, you ought to, you understand, look it up in your Bible. Psalm number 141 and verse number three, David says, Lord, set a watch or set a guard over my mouth, before my mouth. In other words, I'm asking you, Lord, to lock up and to keep the door of my lips. Let me say it one more time. David in the Psalm says, Lord, I need your help because I find it difficult to do some things by myself. And I want to talk right. I really want to speak right. I really want to use the correct words and verbiage. But there are times when things and, and trouble and people and problems and pressures have a way of, you understand, uh, getting, on, getting on me and causing me to revert to an old nature and an old way. And I really don't want to do it, but I find myself doing it. So I'm asking you, Lord, to put a guard on my mouth, to put a watch on my mouth, so that in essence, before I say something, I think about what I'm going to say. Before something comes up and comes out, I get a chance to, you understand, massage it in my mind before it makes its way out of my mouth and say, hold on, I don't have to say it like that, or I don't have to say that. I can find another way, a better way, you understand, a more spiritual and Christian way to say what I need to say rather than allowing the devil to take charge and control and to make me act ugly and to make me act ignorant and to make me act a downright fool or foolish. And so it is when, when we hear from Paul, even in Romans chapter 3, verses 13 through 14, he, he talks about people in the church at Rome and he talks about believers in the church at Rome who do not honor God and reverence God because out of their mouth is constantly spewed all kind of dirty and obscene and profane and filthy and offensive and detestable language all kinds of dirty jokes. I remember a fellow from way back in the day by the name of Dolomite. And some of y'all may have come from that generation back in the day where there was this man called Dolomite. And Dolomite was a man who knew how to cuss and he knew how to cuss big time. And, 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 and little did I know that every time I was listening to Dolomite, I was being trained, I was being taught, I was being nurtured, I was being developed to learn how to cuss, 
like Dolomite could. And you know what? I still know some of them words, but I done graduated from Dolomite to the deliverer. I've graduated from his sinful language to the kind of words that the Savior would want me to say. And all I'm simply saying to you, my brothers and sisters, is that Paul says that you got to remember that there was an old you, but now there is a new you, and the new you cannot revert back to saying and living and acting and doing and speaking the kind of things that the old you used to do without any regret and without any regard. Oh my goodness, you read Romans chapter 3, verse 13 and verse number 14, and here's what you would discover, that Paul says that, that these people who have no real regard for God himself, who talk the way they want to talk like God ain't looking and like God ain't listening, here's what Paul says. Paul says that their throats are like an open grave. And you know, an open grave, I'm talking about where somebody's been buried, is a place that stinks. Oh, yes. So in other words, Paul says that people who use a lot of vulgarity are people whose mouths are filled with stinky or stinky words and phrases that they're going to use on somebody or about somebody. He said that their tongues practice deceit. In other words, they are lie in a Minnesota minute. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. It's in your Bible. It's in your Bible unless you done tore it out, done ripped the page out, or you done scratched it out. Listen, it's in your Bible. Paul says that there are some people who have no real respect and reverence for God and nobody else and no place else, and their mouth is always full of cursing and bitterness. So in other words, as I try to turn the corner here, Paul argues that the wrong kind of language, whether we speak it in apathy, a I just don't care, or if we speak it out of anger, somebody done made me mad. He says this type of language has the ability to wound somebody. This type of language has the ability to hurt somebody. This type of language has the ability to damage those that hear it. Listen, whether you're using it against your partner, whether you're using it against your spouse, whether you're using it against your friends, whether you're using it against members in your family, whether you're using it against your children, Paul says, understand this, you cannot use the kind of language that, that, that uh, diminishes the value of a person. You cannot use the kind of language that destroys the morale of a person and the spirit of a person. And you cannot use the kind of language that has a way of derailing relationship that were once holy and happy. And now it's like, you understand, nightmare on Elm Street or hell on the street where you live. Paul said, you can't use that kind of language without it harming and without it wounding and without it damaging the person that hears it. What will your children learn by your using that kind of language. I tell you what they will learn. They will learn that when they get upset, that's what they're supposed to do. They will learn that when I want to talk bad to somebody, that's what I'm supposed to say. They will learn that, you understand, that there's no right or wrong and age ain't got a thing to do with it. They will learn that in essence, if it's all right for you to say it, Clearly, there's going to become a time when it's all right for me to say it. And listen, let me tell you something. Paul says that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 3, Paul says that there should not even be a hint of this kind of language and verbiage among believers. In other words, this is something we should refrain from. 
This is something we should avoid. I know it's uncomfortable. I know it's tight, but it's right. I'm right in the Bible. I'm right in the Bible. If you got a problem with the message, don't get upset with me because I'm just giving you what God gives you right in his word. And believe me, it challenges all of us from the one that's doing the talking to the one that's doing the listen. Listen, my brothers and sisters, we are not to be crowd pleasers. I said to you that there are people who sometimes use this kind of language because they're in a certain crowd and it helps them to fit in and blend in. I see little children walking down the street sometimes across in front of the church and they just using all type of language. And I said, oh my goodness, listen at these babies, listen at these little third and fourth graders and, and stuff like that with their little uniforms on walking down the street. I mean, cussing up a storm big time. Where did they get this kind of language from? Did they get it from a Christian parent using it in the house where they live when things are not going right, when things are not going their way, when things are not going in their favor? Where did they get this kind of language? I don't believe they got it all from television and from these artists who are the rappers of today's time. Some of the stuff they've learned how to speak, they've heard it from somebody who they look up to as being a child of God. Listen, we are not to be crowd pleasers. We are to be people who seek to please Jesus Christ. We are be possessing the kind of qualities that God could put his stamp and seal of approval on. The truth of the matter is, we ought to have some good qualities about us, but those good qualities ought to be not only in the things we do, but those good qualities ought to manifest themselves also in the things that we say. Listen, my brothers and sisters, the Bible helps us to understand that we've got to learn how to use the right kind of words with our family, with our friends, and even with our foes. And I know that there are times when you want to just let people have a real good piece of your mind. But can I tell you what the Bible says? Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. A whole lot of times Jesus was attacked verbally by others. But I can't remember one time where Jesus responded or retaliated to the attacks of others by using curse words or bad language. I know that there's a cussing preacher in the Bible. His name was Peter. And I understand you know, he, he let his emotions get the best of him. Somehow or another, he allowed himself, you understand, on that day when the Lord told him, listen, you're going to deny me three times. And people say, no, I ain't going to do it. I'll never deny you. And some of y'all who know the story, you know the Bible, know that there were some places where Peter went as he followed the Lord after the Lord had been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And some people saw him and said, ain't you one of those disciples? He said, oh, no, not me. And he went a little bit fuller, still following the Lord from a distance. And somebody else saw him say, wait a minute, that looked like, that looked like one of them disciples I saw with Jesus. And Peter said, oh, no, 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 it ain't me. Uh -uh, I ain't with him. And then it came to the third time. And somebody say, wait a minute, you are one of those disciples. You, you, you talk like one of those disciples. Your, your language is betraying you. And you know what Peter did? Peter started cursing. The Bible says he cursed. I don't know what curse words he used, but whatever words he used, it didn't mean he had the right to use them or he used them, if you will, at the right time. All I'm simply saying is that the old nature in him came out of him and he used words that the Bible called cursing and swearing. And I want to suggest to you, my brothers and sisters, that we've got to learn how to get beyond and grow beyond that. We never hear the Bible saying Peter cursed anymore after that. Why? Because the Holy Spirit 
Amen. Indwelt him. The Holy Spirit became a part of his life. The Holy Spirit became a part of his experience. The Holy Spirit helped to govern and guide his expressions. Nowhere in the rest of the Bible do we find Peter after the Lord really converted him and changed him using those type of words and language again. And so I want to suggest to you tonight as I close that our salvation should cause us to be respectful in our speech toward one another. Our salvation ought to cause us to be respectful in our speech uh -huh, in the presence of others. And even when we're just talking about things, if we're not talking about people, we got to be careful of the words and the verbiage and the language we use because we want to be sure that our life always represents and reflects the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives who is there to help us. So my challenge to you tonight is to make him your model, not Peter, but Jesus, to mimic him, to pattern yourself after him. You do know he was lied on, but even though he was lied on, he didn't curse folk out. You do know he was talked about, but even though he was talked about, he didn't curse out those who talked about him. You do know he was mistreated, he was abused, he was persecuted, he was even killed, but the Bible says that even during those very dark and difficult times uh, when deadly things were happening to him, the Bible says he never said a mumbling word. I want to suggest to you, if you have a problem, amen, using the right words, learn how to do this. Zip your lip so that you say nothing at all. Saying nothing at all doesn't mean that you are weak. It just simply means you determined to be meek. Saying nothing at all doesn't mean that you don't have nothing to say. It's just that you choose to say nothing. Listen, let the Lord handle it. Let the Lord deal with those who use the wrong type of language in your presence as well as toward you or about you. And whatever you do, don't retaliate using the same type of language toward them, about them, or even use the wrong kind of language about some things. Again, Paul says to us as believers, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And if you're going to say something, huh, Big Mama used to say, if you can't say nothing good, don't say anything at all. If you're going to say something, say something that will benefit the person that hears it, that will be a blessing to the person that hears it, that will uplift the person that hears it, that will encourage the person that hears it. You cannot encourage somebody who looks up to you by using language that would cause them to look down on you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you is my prayer tonight as we have just maybe introduced the first message in a series of messages on should a Christian use profanity. Well, stay tuned. We'll see.